We've definitely feel like we've won the lottery in terms of coming to Venice during this period of time because we hear that normally it's so crazy you can't move and now it's great. Almost alone in Venice, something that seemed unthinkable just a few months ago. We'll be talking about new forms of tourism and much more in this new episode of The Urban, the podcast that delves into our connection with the city and the urban lifestyle. We are often told that the future of retail is now online, that people are moving to the countryside and that no one wants to work in an office anymore, at least those who can afford to make such choices. What if we were to turn this upside down? How about envisioning offices as mini urban hubs that enable socializing, learning and entertainment? How about linking cities or workplaces to the value of human experience they provide us? Wouldn't that be refreshing? Well, it turns out that not everybody has lost their attraction to the city. Richard Florida is certainly among those who see the glass as half full. No pandemic has killed off the city or humanity's need to live and work in urban clusters, he says. And Richard Florida is our guest today. He's the best best-selling author of 2002, The Rise of the Creative Class, an urban studies theorist focused on social and economic theory and professor and head of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the Rutman School of Management at the University of Toronto. We will be with him shortly. So it seems that the coronavirus could actually create opportunities to reshape our cities. We don't want to go back uh, to the kind of tourism we had last year because Venice was uh, overwhelmed by tourism. Changes are underway, as you can hear. We'll be visiting the Italian city of Masks, the nice-looking and historical ones, to understand how people there are looking forward to a long-lasting transformation after being overrun by tourists for decades. In this episode, we'll be also talking about interconnections within cities. Francis Pisani, a French journalist, author and expert on cities who explores different models and approaches to their development, will be discussing the limits of smart cities as a concept of the city of the future. Complexity should not be scary because it's part of life. When you understand complexity, it makes things easier, it's less scary and it increases our chances of improving the living. Welcome to this new episode of The Urban Season 2. Hello, Richard Florida. Thanks for joining us from Toronto. We're delighted to have you on The Urban. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Richard, let's begin with your experience as an urban resident. And uh, you can tell us which object best incarnates your vision of a city. Richard, what is your city's object? Well, my city's object in Toronto, I guess it's my object. It's uh, my bicycle, which I ride uh, through the city most every day. I guess that's my object in my city. What about this object? Is it an electrical one? No, I have to pedal for exercise. So it's a regular derailleur bicycle. I mean, I have three. I have one for commuting, one for road cycling. And then I have also, because it's become quite popular uh, in North America as well as in Europe, a so-called gravel bicycle, which is a road bike with bigger tires and a little bit different gearing. And, and that's what I've been doing more and more of, to be quite honest. Very nice, Richard. Let's cycle together to our main topic, which is the value of city and their attractiveness. First of all, Richard, how would you define the value of a city? Actually, what makes it valuable? Well, I mean, I think there are lots of ways to value a city in terms of the quality of life, the perspective it gives its people, the lens on the world of diversity and engagement, the ability of a city to generate, you know, all of the great cultural and creative advances in society have come from, you know, cities, cities in ancient times, which were the densest human settlements. They may not look like cities we have today, but they were the densest human settlements of their time. But I think when you say value, it just brings to mind economic value. In that sense, cities are where wealth is generated. They are the places throughout human history and human civilization where we have generated not just advances in arts and culture and in language, which are so important to our development as a species, but where we have really built our economies, whether those were 
simple economies are now, you know, and trading economies are now very advanced knowledge and innovation, talent-based economies. So I think in Canada, where I am today, Toronto produces about 20% of all economic value. If you take Canada, large cities probably produce 85 or 90%. Paris is probably a third or maybe more of all economic value produced in France. Cities are a big deal economically, and we forget that. What would um, the difference be, for example, between uh, the US, Canada, and some cities in Europe in regard to their attractiveness? And in that sense, I also mean, you know, the innovation clusters, for example. Well, I think the US is really an outlier. And maybe it has something in common with one other advanced country, Germany, in that the US has many, many, many cities, if you just think about it. And I'm not trying to make value judgments. You think of France and you think of Paris, you think of the United Kingdom and you think of London, you think of Japan and you think of Tokyo. And all of those play a very outsized role in, in the housing of population for those countries and in their country's economic value creation. The United States has New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and Washington, D.C. It has 360-some metropolitan areas of size. And by way of comparison, Toronto is probably as economically significant to Canada as New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Boston and San Francisco combined. So the U.S., its urban system ha is less aggregated. It's more decentralized. And Germany Germany is something like that. The other thing that's very different is that U.S. cities are financed primarily with local taxation, which means that their schools in particular are not very good. They're vexed by long-running problems for many reasons of urban crime. They house disproportionate concentrations of very disadvantaged people so that American cities suffer from a more general urban crisis. And you've seen that with the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, certainly I'm very careful. I don't go to stores. I don't go to restaurants. I've said and physically distanced. I work from home. But Toronto seems pretty much normal to me. Whereas in the U.S., they are very much more challenged by this pandemic, not just in terms of public health, but in terms of getting people back to work, getting people to go back to a normal routine. So I think the U.S. cities are unique in that they've suffered for a long time from a deeper urban crisis because schools are locally financed, because crime and violence are higher. They've just suffered from more challenges and more problems. And the COVID pandemic and the social and economic and political challenges associated with it has just hit U.S. cities harder. So I I think U.S. cities are different than Canadian or European cities. What does the uh, COVID-19 pandemic then bring in terms of maybe experimentation, which is uh, what's in the air right now? Uh, and what's the balance between this experimentation time and some harsh consequences that we are certainly going to see developed following the COVID-19 crisis, as you mentioned, such as violence, poverty in some cities? What's going on and what are the push and pull factors? It's really interesting. When this pandemic struck, you know, I'm an urbanist, probably nearly four decades into a career as an urbanist, and I had never once given thought to the role of pandemics or plagues or infectious disease in the process of urbanization and urban development. I wasn't taught about it as an undergraduate studies, didn't cover it in my own research. So that's telling me something. That's telling me that the force of urbanization and urban development is far stronger than pandemics and the pestilence. If you look back in history at the plagues that struck Europe that killed 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the population of certain cities, if you look at the cholera epidemics, tuberculosis, I could go on, the Spanish flu, we didn't have modern medicine, we didn't have advanced healthcare systems, we didn't have antivirals, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have uh, antibacterials like penicillin. And still, you know, cities survived and grew and we became more urban. So the first order answer is that our cities will survive and thrive. Paris will be a great city. London will be a great city. New York will be a great city. And, and rich people have long decamped from cities when there are stresses or bouts of infectious disease or pestilence. I undertook a very deep study of the role of infectious disease in pandemics. In fact, I wrote a paper recently with a fellow, Mike Storper, who teaches at Poe in Paris, along with LSE, and another scholar from Madrid, Andres Rodriguez Pose. Look, I, I think that we had a lot of dystopian clamor early in this pandemic, partly because it struck big cities like New York and Paris and London and Madrid hardest and first. But everything we know is those cities were struck, not because they're dense, not because they're urban, but because they're big and they're connected to the world economy. So is there a balance here or is there even something positive that can come out of this experimentation? Well, I think out of all crises, if we're smart about it and we use a crisis as an opportunity to change for the better, good can come out of it. It doesn't seem that way now. It seems very harsh and very difficult, and very scary. And it still does, you know, 
But cities are far stronger than infectious disease. One thing that convinces me of that is that cities have simply grown throughout human history. And before we had modern medicine and modern healthcare systems, cities grew and grew. I mean, over human histories, cities have and urbanization has continued apace. Even at times when, you know, in Europe during the periods of the plague, infectious disease killed 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the population of certain cities. You know, in that nearly four decade career as an urbanist, what shocks me really and quite surprises me is that I've never once really considered the effect of infectious disease or pestilence or pandemics. Uh, it wasn't a part of my own research. It's not part of the big literature. It's, it's been covered by, you know, people who health or public health, but it wasn't a big thing, which, which suggests to me, you know, and other things were the advent of transportation the advent of new technology, the role of economic crises, all those things were covered. So it suggests to me that cities are far more powerful. You know, I think now we're going through this phase of experimentation. I think that we're now seeing cities begin to try to grapple with this. And it seems like most of our cities have been squarely behind the proverbial eight ball. They've not been forward looking. You know, when this crisis first struck, they just rushed to lock down and try to mobilize medical capacity, which is important. But at that point back in March, I was writing and talking about the need to develop protocols for safe reopening, to equip restaurants and commercial enterprises and small businesses, airports, public events venues, and reopen safely. For the past several months, I've been writing about the need to develop detailed recovery plans, like you would from a natural disaster, like a great fire or flood or hurricane. And very few cities have been doing that. Now they're beginning to talk about it. So I think that the recovery from this is really important. And therein, cities have to be very strategic and intentional, because if they're not, you know, we will just rebound or boomerang back to the old normal. And best case in point I can give you is that what happened in the wake of the Spanish flu in the late 19s? Well, that was followed not by a period of great introspection and a period of great investment in better cities and a period of social equity. It was period by the Roaring Twenties in Paris and London and New York. You know, it was a giant party. It took a long time to the Great Depression and the post-World War II effort to really start to think about how to build better social safety nets and more equitable cities. So we should be careful what we wish for, and we should think long and hard about how we'd like to rebuild our cities so that they're healthier more equitable and and more vibrant as an outcome of this pandemic. Talking about recovery, talking about opportunity and experimentation, Richard, let me fly you and our listeners as well to Venice in Italy. It's been hit hard by the Aqua Alta in November 2019. It's a tide which damaged scores of buildings and reduced the number of visitors at the start of the year. And now Venice, like Of course, all tourist cities around the world has received another blow from the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Two months of lockdown have confirmed the need to rethink tourism in the lagoon to preserve this fragile city and help an economy heavily dependent on the sector. Let's join there. Xavier Sartre, who's reporting. With no traffic jams blocking the shopping streets and plenty of space on a cafe terrace to enjoy a spritz, Venice has never been as peaceful as it has been this summer. For Giorgio, a Venetian upset by what's become of his city, it's a joy. He says Venice has turned into a sort of Disneyland. With COVID, I think that Venetians have realized that we cannot live only on tourism. And we got to see the city as it once was, a wonderful city where we can walk around. My wife and I have been to the Piazza San Marco three times. It's been years since we've been there because we couldn't get anywhere near it. Visiting Venice under these conditions is an incredible chance for tourists to enjoy it like never before. Tom is on a road trip across Europe and he says he has savoured his stop off in Venice. From having spoken to a lot of people, we've definitely feel like we've won the lottery in terms of coming to Venice during this period of time because we hear that normally it's so crazy you can't move and now it's great because you can go around and you can see all the great things without being stuck in the crazy crowds and probably prices are a little bit cheaper than normally as well so it seems like a bonus. Tourist guides also appreciate the calm, even if there is a lack of work. Giulia Ciatara led two or three visits a day last year, but since business restarted in June, she's only taken a few groups. She says she has no regrets. 
Of course, what you see today is a tourism which is different. We don't want to go back to the kind of tourism we had last year because Venice was overwhelmed by tourism. And this was keeping away the tourists that were really interested in the city. Last year, you could have questions like, are people really living here in Venice? Are these houses? Of course, now, the kind of tourists that are coming, they know. They don't ask this kind of questions. This influx of visitors staying only a short time has had a negative effect on residents, even those who live off tourism. That's close to 65% of all people who work in Venice. Eliana Giordano, who makes papier-mâché masks, says that the problem has become the kind of tourist the city attracts. It's tourism that is no use to anybody, neither to us who work in the city nor to the tourists. The money that was coming in was not profiting anybody. This crisis has made us understand that we should take a step backwards and review the entire way tourism is organized, because we had developed a tourist industry without scruples toward anyone, especially not toward this fragile city. How is it possible to truly appreciate a city if you only spend a few hours there? But that's what the majority of tourists do now, especially the 1,500 passengers on average spilling out of every cruise ship in the lagoon who only spend a few hours at the port. Visitors who stay at least one night are however welcomed by tourism professionals and also by the municipality who now want to favour them. Paola Ma is the city official in charge of tourism. We thought about introducing an access contribution for day trippers. It was due to start on July 1st. The intention was not to make it a tax, but to promote long-term reservations and encourage people not to make last-minute trips. On top of that, 51 micro-objectives have been launched after a city-wide consultation launched in 2017 on the future of tourism. Around half of them have already been achieved, says Paolo Mar. It is now impossible to automatically turn a residence into a hotel without the prior consent of the municipal council. You cannot open new hotels in the historic centre. It's the same for bars and restaurants and the takeaways. We hired new local police. We set up a system that counts people using Wi-Fi and sensors and cameras to know the daily visitor numbers. The municipality also wants to promote the conversion of souvenir shops into local amenities. While Venice searches for a way to profit from tourism without getting damaged by it, the city must also strike a balance in the classic dilemma of quantity or quality. Rethinking attractiveness also means undertaking deep changes. Richard Florida, would you say that Venice can make it this way? I think Venice has survived a lot of very bad things. So yes, I think Venice can make it. It seems the real challenge for Venice is twofold. One is with many cities, you know, Paris is experiencing this, Barcelona, New York. Now that the pandemic has really limited tourism, to use this as a pause or resetting moment to rethink tourism strategy and to figure out the right kind of tourism for your community. People in Venice or Paris or Madrid or Barcelona or New York would know that. And how that benefits the economy while benefiting residents by not making residents feel terrible about their city or worse. Sometimes, you know, when you've got these kind of horrific kind of tourism problems. People leave. Residents leave. They don't want businesses leave. They don't want to be there anymore. The second problem is the deeper and more intractable one is how does Venice deal with the oncoming onslaught of challenges brought by global warming and climate change? And that's not just up to Venice, you know, that's up to the world. It is the fact of the matter that most of the world's great cities, the great preponderance of them are coastal cities and will and are being negatively affected by climate change and sea level rise and other weather related problems. So yeah, I think I think Venice has an opportunity to turn this challenge into something better, but it has to do that. And we'll be talking about the effect of climate change on our coastal and other cities in episode five. You're absolutely right to mention this. Now, we've talked about tourism, but could the educated class at the center of this gentrification that you've widely described in your books now turn around and leave cities as well? 
Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think we've heard a lot of prognostication about this, and there are just a lot of doomsayers out there, and there are a lot of people who don't like cities. There is evidence to suggest they leave for a while, the affluent and the educated, but they come back. I think there are two sets of forces that will act on cities. The first are very legitimately pull forces that will pull certain groups of people out of cities. I think those are the people who have generally left cities. And I think those forces are more at work in U.S. cities than French or European cities. They are forces that cause families, people with children, to leave cities. In the U.S., that's because urban schools aren't very good. Cities tend to be more violent. Uh, They're not just good places to raise families. And I can say this as someone who lives in Toronto and is an American. Toronto is just a much better city to raise a family in for a whole variety of reasons than is the United States. The same would be said of Paris or London. But the second set of forces are push factors. And what we find is that cities are very attractive to certain kinds of people, like young people. Young people move to cities because they offer great economic opportunity. They enable them to meet friends, to develop networks, to go on dates, to find a spouse or life partner. And I think, you know, so one thing we're likely to see is at the margin as the pandemic progresses and until we have a vaccine, our cities are probably going to get younger. So no, they won't be abandoned, but they'll change. I think the other thing that will be maybe bigger is that I think we'll see a shift in our cities. You know, I think over the past hundred years, ever since the main industrial revolution, we have separated living from working. People began to walk to factories and then take rudimentary forms of public transit, and then they got cars, and then we developed these central office areas where people commuted to, whether that's on transit or trains or in a private automobile. I think that's going to change. I think one of the big shifts in the pandemic is people aren't going to commute as much. More knowledge workers, you mentioned the educated class, are going to work remotely. They're not going to want to endure 30 minute, 40 minutes, hour plus commutes. And that in the city, the central business district or office center will become filled with more residential. They will become more mixed use, if you will. And that out in the suburbs, which used to be just about living, they will develop more office places. People won't come to these offices every day, but they'll go to them when they have a meeting or occasionally. The word I like to use for this is regional rebalancing. I think we're going to rebalance and reset our lives so that we begin to reintegrate life and work, the places we live and the places we work. And maybe I call this, some people call it the 15 minute neighborhood where we can live, work and do everything we need within 15 minutes of our home. I like a word called complete communities. I think we're going to build more complete communities where we live and work and do our daily needs closer to where our primary residence is. Can this affect our creativity? Do we need to be physically together to create, to innovate in cities? A hundred percent. You know, history shows this can't be done remotely. And no matter how good we get it, on this, the research is pretty clear. To develop new things, whether that's new technological innovations or new artistic innovations, new forms of music, new forms of painting. In technology, they say that requires a cluster of people working, scientists, engineers, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, big companies, universities, all clustered together. In music and the arts, they call it a scene, you know, where painters and musicians are kind of learning from one another, but competing with one another. They're part of a scene. They're combining. And in all of these things, what we're seeing is a process of combination and recombination. So no, I mean, I know people say this every 10 years, there's another prediction of the end of cities, the end of communities, the overcoming of distance. And every time people make those prognostications loud and every time it's wrong. What's the office scene going to be then in the future? One office scene is where I'm talking to you today in a home office that's very different than my home office was 20 or 30 years ago. The house will become an office. You know, I think 20 or 30 years ago, we started to look at the kitchen and the family room and the open, what they call the open concept is the big thing where people gathered and it had a television and a stereophonic system and the kids had a playroom there. And then we added a home gym for people who didn't want to go to the fitness center and all of this boom and home exercise equipment. I think the big change is going to be that the home is going to be also an office. But aren't we, Richard, in this conversation, excluding manual workers or care workers whose role and value has been considered more than ever following this pandemic crisis? You know, isn't that a little chat between gentrified people that we are having here? Look, about 30 or 40 percent of us, depending on how you slice it, have the privilege of being able to work remotely. Artists, musicians, scientists, engineers, managers, business people, educators. Like it or not, with all the pain that's inflicted, we can work remotely. And we can, in doing so, avoid the virus. But there is another 40 or 50% of the workforce, depending on whose numbers you lay. I place it closely at 50. 
when you take construction workers and transportation workers, bus drivers and taxi and rideshare drivers, you take service workers, you know, people who work in warehouses, grocery, delivery, you add all of that up, healthcare providers. It's about half of the workforce that are direct frontline workers who are the great heroes of this pandemic. They have been far more exposed to this virus. Their rates of contracting the virus and death In the United States, there are far more women and minorities that do this kind of work. The rates of victimization by COVID of African-Americans, they've been four times as likely to get it and twice as likely to die. It exposes a deep class divide. And I want to reinforce that. A class divide based not on our level of education or on where we live or on the kind of clothes we buy. A class divide in the Marxian sense based on the kind of work we do. There are those of us who work with our minds and can shelter from the pandemic. There are those of us who work with our hands, whether making things or providing services, who can't. And that divide has become a point of political contestation, overlaid, of course, with the fact that there's a gender component to it and there's a component of race and ethnicity to it. And look, that's reverberating through our societies in all ways, shapes and forms in the political divides we see. So we are having a big reckoning about and we're going to have to have a reckoning about, by the way. I think cities are much more able to solve that problem or ameliorate that problem or mitigate that problem or develop political solutions because all different kinds of people live in cities. Cities are politically contested. Even gentrified cities like Paris or London or New York are quite a bit more diverse than many suburban gated enclaves. And we're seeing this. Cities are becoming the places that are being politically contested over just this. So, yeah, I think the predicament of frontline workers and racial and ethnic minorities being disproportionately vulnerable to the virus has caused a political earthquake and reckoning that has come due and is really necessary. What city scheme could then emerge? Are our cities going to turn into a leisure hub, a consumption hub? What are they going to be next? So I, I think that cities are all of those things. They are places for production. They are places for consumption. They are places for leisure. And again, to invoke a Marxian concept, they're places for reproduction. They're places where we reproduce ourselves. We reproduce our economy. We reproduce our society and all of its good and bad, including its class divisions. I think if anything, the pandemic will shift the balance away from consumption and leisure back to production at the margin. I think that cities have become to be too overly valued for the consumption and leisure activities. And I think the fact that those are risky activities will mean that cities have to become more valued by production. And I think that's a good thing. You know, I think that as cities become more affordable, as commercial property becomes less valuable, as retail space becomes less valued because it's less demanded, that means there'll be more space for residential, for people to live. With more space comes more competition, more supply, lower prices. But I think the market alone will make cities somewhat more affordable and somewhat more valued for their productivity as opposed to their consumption or leisure. And can we envision that they are going to be also more inclusive? A resilient community might emerge following the pandemic? Not unless we're intentional about that one. I think that what we're seeing is that this pandemic is reinforcing inequality in all its shape, socioeconomic, class-based, racial, and ethnic. In terms of health outcomes, it's hitting hardest at racial and ethnic minorities and frontline workers. In terms of economic impacts, it's hitting much harder at small business, at frontline workers than it is at professional workers or multinational large-scale tech businesses. It's hitting much harder at people who don't own stocks or other forms of capital than those do. I think without systematic intervention in the form of local and national public policy, it will make inequality worse. The other dimension of this is if the pandemic continues to put a premium on private consumption, personalized services, the fact that people are scared to put their kids in school, don't want to go to a gym, don't want to take transit, want to use a private car, Many of the things that cities could provide publicly, from schooling to transit to amenity, visiting a museum, going to a restaurant, those things become stratified in a new way by class. So I think that the more that this pandemic shifts from public provision of services to private, more personalized provision of services, it radically increases inequity. And look, it's going to take really intentional and strategic public policy intervention to make sure we're equitable. But we've done it before, you know, and we need to do it again. 
Richard, this interview and your explanations, of course, tell us a lot about the complexity of our cities. We cannot understand them, bring them to life or transform them without taking into account a multiplicity of elements, their interactions, the whole they form and the multiple assemblies in which they fit together. This is how Francis Pisani, who's a French journalist, author and expert on cities, explores different models and approaches to their development. We've asked him to tell us about his own vision of a city. A city is something complex. Complex is not to say complicated, nor to say holistic, meaning something perceived as a whole. When you take a holistic approach to a city, you don't see everything that's going on inside it, all the daily interactions. A city is like an organism or a cell, it's like a business with elements able to self-organize thanks to their interactions. What is changing in the world is that the reality of life on the planet is defined less by physical borders and more by flows. Flows of people, data, goods. I wouldn't talk about globalization, but more about flowbalization, meaning the organization of life on the planet through its flows. We talk about smart cities. I don't think there is such a thing as a smart city. There are only projects and processes that can help to improve cities. If we take on board the notion of complexity, we can't think in terms of fixing things. We should assume that we're going to improve conditions. That's what matters. I think we can move forward, we can integrate better, and that everybody can participate in this new integration. Municipalities, businesses, associations, people in general, and of course technology. Richard, do you share this vision of a complex city and the idea that better integrations is a necessity? Well, I think cities by definition, and we have a tremendous amount of research to back this up, are complex systems. And probably of all human systems, they're the most complex. And that's what makes them so difficult to plan for, build strategy around. And maybe it's best to think of cities, you know, instead of thinking them as top down, you know, where the mayor or the leadership calls the shots, maybe it's best to think of them as these complex systems where the actions of many different types of people, many different types of businesses, many different types of real estate all come together to form this constantly adapting complex process. So yeah, I think cities are case studies in complexity. They defy our abilities to really plan for them. There's lots of unanticipated consequences. But at the end of the day, they're the best we've got. You know, they're the best thing we've built. They're the most malleable, adaptive, resilient. They don't really die. Other stuff dies. So the short answer is yes, it is right to think of cities as complex systems. In the end, will urbanization remain stronger than the pandemic? You've said yes already. But what city scheme will emerge, in your view? Well, it's hard to say in advance. I think what we can say looking at past history is that great pandemics and plagues, far more deadly and virulent than the current one, have done little to damp down the process of urbanization. Cities are far stronger than pandemics and plague. I think that our cities and suburban areas, our metropolitan regions, will be reshaped. I think that cities will still be the primary mover in our economies, that we will not overcome. There won't be this back to the second and third tier city movement or back to the countryside movement. We'll still have geographic inequity. I think that remote work is is here to stay. I think there'll be a shift towards more complete communities. People will really demand places where they can live and work seamlessly. What I think is going to be one of the biggest shifts in the pandemic is remote education. All my classwork has been remote. All my kids' schoolwork until very recently has been remote. Most university students I know are doing remote schooling. Many of the teenagers I know are going to remote high school. That's going to be hard to undo. And I think that people are going to have, just like they're going to have more flexibility in their work, they're going to have more flexibility in where their kids go to school. University age students are going to have a lot more choice in where they can get education. Not that education will be unbound or unwound from place. And I think that at the end of the day is going to be the biggest new thing to come out of the pandemic. It's not remote work or work from home. It's not telemedicine. It's going to be deep and enduring changes in the way we educate and learn. Are we now, and that will be the conclusion, entering a new era, an era that is post this urban revival you've written on or about? 
No, I think we're still in the middle of the shift. In the early days, I wouldn't say in the middle. What we're really experiencing is the shift to a knowledge economy and away from an industrial economy. An industrial economy was based on the location of resources. So you got the emergence of all sorts of places that had large concentrations of resources. The knowledge economy is really fundamentally based on clustering of people. And so the knowledge economy makes cities, metropolitan areas, platforms for innovation and technological growth and for economic well-being. And that's only going to grow, you know, because offices are no longer important. Cities are no longer, no, it's not the offices that the fundamental factor. They're just warehouses for people to do work. It's the clustering of talent that's the fundamental factor. And that talent is going to cluster more and more in metropolitan regions. Now, some of that talent may be in the center city. Some of that talent may be in the suburbs, but it'll be in what we call the metropolitan region or the megalopolitan region. So no, this move to more larger scale urbanization at the metropolitan level is here to stay. And if anything, we're in its infancy, especially when we take our purview away from the West and we look at the development of Asia, where the majority of human civilization lives. If you look there, the development of metropolitan areas and megalopolitan areas is surging. So no, the 21st century will remain this, the century of urbanization. Uh, we'll look back at this. And this will be the time, I think, that we get to make a choice. I think it's not only an opportunity, I think it's obligation to make the right choice. The right choice is to build urban areas that are more inclusive, safer, healthier, and resilient, that offer more people more opportunity, that confer benefits on the largest possible set of the population. I'm not sure we're ready to make that choice. The, the current model of urbanization is very divided. It's very inequitable with regard to socioeconomic class, race, and geography. And unless these political movements really stick, and remember, counter to these political movements for equity along racial and economic lines, we have a surge in nationalism and so-called populism, nationalistic populism. Unless we are really strategic and intentional about building better and more inclusive uh, and more resilient and healthier cities, they're not going to make themselves. And like I said, this is not only our opportunity, this is our obligation. This, in an era of urbanization and of city building, this is our obligation to ourselves and to future generations. Thank you, Richard Florida. Urbanization is definitely greater than pandemics and metropolization is still on its way and has a future. Thanks again, Richard Florida, for your explanations and for joining us from Toronto. And thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. It's a pleasure. 